Dear friends, let us learn about the joints of thorax. So the various joints of thorax which you are going to learn are those connecting the various bones of the thorax that is the sternum, the vertebrae and the ribs with one another. The joints of thorax can be broadly classified into intervertebral joints, sternal joints, costovertebral joints and costosternal joints. In this picture, we are seeing the thoracic vertebrae, the sternum and the ribs. The joints between the vertebrae, the various parts of the vertebrae or the intervertebral joints and the joints between the various parts of the sternum or the sternal joints, the joints between the rib and vertebrae is the costovertebral joints. The joints between the rib and the sternum or the costosternal joints. In this flow chart, you can see the classification of the joints and the joints are classified into the intervertebral, sternal, costovertebral and costosternal joints. The intervertebral joints, there are subcategories and they are the joints between the bodies of the vertebrae, the joints between articular processes, joints between spines, joints between laminae and joints between transverse processes. The sternal joints are divided into two types. They are the manubriosternal, xiphysternal joints. The costovertebral joints are of two types. The joints between the rib and the vertebrae, that is the bodies of the vertebrae, and the joints between the rib and transverse process of vertebrae. Then the costosternal system consists of the costochondral joints between the rib and the costal cartilage and the joint between the costal cartilage and sternum known as the sternocostal joints and the interchondral joints. Now let us learn about the intervertebral joints. The intervertebral joints can be union between vertebral bodies or between articular processes. The union between vertebral bodies is known as the median or symphysial joints. The union between articular processes is known as lateral or gigapophysial joints. In this picture, you can see the bodies of the vertebrae which are covered with a layer of hyaline cartilage and between the bodies you are seeing the intervertebral discs which consists of central nucleus, pulposus and peripheral annulus fibrosus. So these are the intervertebral joints. In this you can see the posteriorly and anteriorly the bodies of vertebrae are joined by the anterior longitudinal ligament anteriorly and the posterior longitudinal ligament posteriorly. In this picture, you can see the joints between the vertebrae with ligaments. Then this is the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament and the ligaments connecting the laminae and these are the spines which are connected by interspinous and supraspinous ligaments. Now coming to the intervertebral joints under which the symphysial joints where the union is by articulations. So the symphysial joints or the joints between vertebral bodies 
and you have seen in the pic previous picture that they are covered with iron cot lace pla plates and the intervertebral disc of white fibrocotylase is uniting these bodies of the vertebrae and they have longitudinal ligaments that is the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament which is seen anterior and posterior to the intervertebral discs and bodies of the vertebrae. That is what you are seeing in this picture. So, this is the anterior longitudinal ligament in front of the anterior surface of bodies of the vertebra and the intervertebral discs. And this is the posterior longitudinal ligament in relation with the posterior surface of bodies of vertebra and the intervertebral discs. The intervertebral discs are present between the bodies of the vertebra. There are two parts of the intervertebral discs. One is the annulus fibrosus which you are seeing at the periphery. It consists of collagen fibers and these are one with connecting the one vertebra to the other and they are oblique in orientation and prevent excessive rotation of vertebra and they also add strength to the vertebra and they are fibrocotylaginous. The inner nucleus pulposus it is a remnant of embryonic notochord and it is soft and gelatinous in the egg and it is gradually replaced with fibrocotylage and it matches with the annulus fibrosis. So, you are seeing the outer annulus fibrosis consists of collagen fibers and it is a fibrocotylage oblique in direction and prevents the excessive rotation of vertebrae. It also adds strength to the vertebra and the central nucleus pulposus which is an embryonic remnant of notochord and it is soft and gelatinous it gradually merges with the annulus fibrosus and it is replaced by fibrocotylage gradually. The intervertebral discs show thickness variations. Reason wise, in the upper thoracic region, they are thinnest and less mobile, and in the lower lumbar, they are the thickest. In the cervical and lumbar regions, they are thick anteriorly, and in the thoracic region, they are flat. They contribute to one fifth of the length of the vertebral column. This is what you are seeing in this picture. And the functions of the intervertebral discs are they facilitate weight transmission and they act as shock absorbers and they facilitate formation of the curvatures. In this picture you can see the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral curvatures of the vertebral column which is formed by the vertebrae, the bodies of vertebra the spines you are seeing and the intervertebral discs which contribute for one fifth length of the vertebral column, the rest being contributed by the vertebrae and they are thinnest in the upper thoracic region and which is least mobile and thickest in the lower lumbar region and in the cervical and lumbar regions. They are thick anteriorly and they act as shock absorbers and they facilitate formation of curvatures and they facilitate weight transmission. Then the other intervertebral joint is the gigopophysial or facet joints. These are the joints between the articular processes. You know that there is a pair of superior and a pair of 
inferior articular processes in relation with each vertebra so which resemble like the letter h an inferior one will articulate with the superior facet of the next vertebra and these are synovial joints in the cervical and thoracic region the facets are flat so that's why they are plain joints and the lumbar region they are curved from side to side so in this picture we are seeing the superior and inferior facets of the vertebrae the articular processes and then the articulating joint between the inferior articular process of one vertebra with the superior articular process of the next vertebra the intervertebral joints that are formed by union by ligaments so let us learn the ligaments connecting the adjacent vertebra the ligaments connecting the bodies the transverse processes the spinous processes and lamina those connecting the bodies are the anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament and those connecting the transverse processes are the intertransverse ligaments those connecting the spinous processes are the interspinous ligaments and supraspinous ligaments and those connecting the laminae or the ligament of flava or yellow ligaments and in this picture of the vertebra also you can see the location of the anterior longitudinal and posterior longitudinal ligament in relation with the intervertebral disc and the position of the intertransverse ligaments in relation with transverse processes and the ligament of flava connecting the laminae the interspinous ligaments connecting the spines and the supraspinous ligaments connecting the tips of the spines the purpose of these ligaments is to prevent undue movements of vertebrae on one another in this picture you can see the yellow ligaments or the ligament of flava connecting the laminae of the vertebra these are the yellow ligaments and in this picture you can review the various ligaments you can see the anterior longitudinal ligament the intervertebral disc the posterior longitudinal ligament and the position of the ligament of flava in relation with the laminae and you can see the supraspinous and the interspinous ligaments and this is the position of the zygomorphial joint so there are three joints between two adjoining vertebrae there are the facet or zygomorphial joints there are two joints between the right and left articular processes forming a plain synovial joint and the symphysial joint the one between the bodies of the vertebrae and it is formed by the intervertebral discs and it is a secondary cartilaginous joint we have learned about the joints of the thoracic vertebral column so they are the symphysial joints between bodies of vertebra and the synovial joints between articular processes and the ligaments that is syndesmosis connecting the bodies and processes we have learned the movements of thoracic vertebral column are for stability and to facilitate respiratory movements but the movements are restricted both flexion and extension and lateral flexion but rotation is greater in these joints the muscles responsible for these movements are the erector spinae the abdominal muscles 
the short vertebral muscles, the trapezius muscle of the limb and the sternocleidomastoid muscle of the neck. The sternal joints, the second variety of the joints of thoracic cage. So there are two types. The one between the manubrium and body of sternum is known as the manubrio sternal joint. The one between the body of sternum and xiphoid process is known as the xiphi sternal joints. The manubrio sternal joint is the joint between the manubrium and body of sternum and it is also known as the sternal angle. It is a symphysis that is it is secondary cartilaginous joint and the bony union takes place after 30 years and it shows an angulation which is of importance in respiration. Now let us learn about the sternal angle and the angle is about 163 degrees on its posterior aspect and the external angulation is about 17 degrees and the sternal angle is easily felt in all individuals and it forms a surface landmark of anatomical and clinical importance and you have learned in your general anatomy classes on in the class on in osteology about the sternum about the important events that are taking place in the sternal angle and how it dis divides the mediastinum into superior and inferior mediastinum it allows forward and backward movements of body of sternum like a hinge that is the importance of this angle that is the functional importance this angulation increases slightly in inspiration and is less in expiration the clinical importance of this sternal angle is in the case of trauma to this angle which is more common in boxers and in vehicular accidents because of slamming into the steering wheel then the sternal angle pain is observed in diseases of heart walls coronary artery diseases the gastroesophageal reflux disorders and in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases so now you know the what is sternal angulation and what are the degrees internal angulation and external angulation and how it facilitates forward and backward movement of body of sternum like a hinge and its increase which is slight in inspiration and less in expiration and the trauma to sternal angle in boxers and in the vehicular accidents and the pain of sternal angle in heart walls diseases and coronary artery disease and gastroesophageal reflux disorders and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Coming to the xiphysternal joint, it's a symphysis and it is formed between the body of sternum and xiphoid process. The bony union takes place at 40 years and it lies at the level of T9 vertebra and it is a marker for infrasternal angle and it indicates the location of the central tendon of diaphragm. It marks the inferior limit of heart and superior limit of liver and it also marks the lower limit of central part of thoracic cavity. In this picture, you can see both the sternal angle and the xiphysternal joint and the sternal angle separating the superior and inferior mediastinum and the importance of the xiphysternal joint which marks the infrasternal angle, the central tendon of diaphragm, 
the inferior limit of heart and the superior limit of liver. It also marks the lower limit of central part of thoracic cavity. Next is the costovertebral system of joints. There are two types, costovertebral or the costocorporeal joints. Yes, they are the joints between the rib and the vertebral bodies. Then the other variety is the costotransverse joints. In this picture, you can see the bodies of the vertebrae with intervertebral discs and the joint that is formed between the head of the rib and the bodies of the vertebrae and the transverse process of the vertebrae coming in contact with the facet on the tubercle of the rib. So, this picture shows both costocorporeal or costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint. So, the costocorporeal joints are the joints between the head of rib and sides of bodies of vertebrae. The costotransverse joints are the joints between the tubercle of the rib and transverse process of the vertebra. Here you can see the facets on the head of the rib. There are the two facets, a superior and inferior, separated by a crest. And a facet on the tubercle of the rib you are seeing. And in this picture, the facets in relation to the lateral surfaces of the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae and facet on the transverse process of thoracic vertebrae. The joint between the transverse process of thoracic vertebra and the facet on the tubercle of the rib is the costotransverse joint. And the joint between the facets on the lateral surface of bodies of vertebrae that is the superior and inferior facets with the facets on the head of the rib or the costocorporeal joints. Here you can see the facet that is the inferior facet on the head of the rib articulates with the superior facet of the numerically corresponding vertebra. See the T7 rib, the inferior facet of which is articulating with the superior facet on the T7 vertebra, whereas the superior facet of the rib is articulating with the inferior facet on the rib vertebra above. And the crest of in relation with the head of the rib is in contact with the intervertebral disc and the facet on the transverse process of the vertebra in contact with the facet on the tubercle of the numerically corresponding rib. So again let us revise the costovertebral joint. So, you learn that there are two articular facets on the heads of the ribs that will articulate with the demi facets, that is, the costal facets on the sides of bodies of the vertebrae. There are two facets on head of rib with crest in between. The crest is in contact with the intervertebral disc by intraarticular ligament. There is the lower facet of rib articulates with the superior facet of the numerically corresponding vertebra and the upper facet of rib with the lower demi facet on the vertebra above. That's what you can see in this picture and you can see some of the ligaments in relation with the bodies of the vertebra and the head of the rib that is the radiate ligament and then in relation with the transverse processes, the costotransverse ligaments. And this is the costovertebral joint 
and then the cost of transverse joint you can see and the radiate ligament you can see in this view and the cost of transverse ligament what you are seeing this is superior cost of transverse ligament we will learn about them in due course now let us learn some more details about the cost of vertebral joints that will be having a fibrous capsule this is the cost of vertebral or cost of corporeal joint between the head of the rib and the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae with intervening intervertebral disc so the fibrous capsule is strengthened in front by the radiate ligament or tri radiate ligament so intervertebral disc is in the middle and the vertebrae or above and below it the head of the rib articulating with the two vertebra which forms a compound joint the joint cavity is a divided into two parts that's why it is called complex joint though fibrous capsule is single the synovial cavities are two so the ligaments of the costo corporeal joints are the radiate ligament and intra articular ligament the intra articular ligament is in contact with the intervertebral disc and you can see the radiate ligaments extending from the head of the rib to the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae coming to the costo transverse joints these are the joints between the ribs and the transverse processes there is a facet on the tubercle of the rib which articulates with the numerically corresponding vertebral facet on the transverse process of it so it has got the fibrous capsule which is thin and encloses the joint and the superior costo transverse ligament which extends from the upper border of neck of rib to the lower border of transverse process of next higher vertebra and it has got anterior and posterior lamina the anterior lamina blends with the internal intercostal membrane whereas the posterior lamina blends with the external intercostal muscle and the superior costal transverse ligament is opposite in 12th rib in this picture you can see the superior costal transverse ligament the other ligaments of the costal transverse joint or the lateral costal transverse ligament or ligament of the tubercle it extends from the non articular part of the tubercle of the rib to the transverse process of its own vertebra there is the inferior or medial costal transverse ligament or ligament of neck which extends from the posterior surface of neck of rib to the transverse process of its own vertebra the inferior or medial costo transverse ligament is absent or poorly developed in the ligament and twelfth ribs so you have learned about the various ligaments of the costo transverse joints and these are plane joints and allow only gliding movement the ribs move up and down with the bucket handle movement coming to the cost sternal system of joints is at the anterior articulations and there are three types of it there are the costo chondral joints this is the costo chondral joints joints between the rib and the costal cartilage then there is the sterno costal joint between the sterno and the costal cartilages and interchondral joints the costo chondral joints are the those between the depression at the anterior end of the rib with the rounded lateral end of the costal cartilage and the union of these is by continuity of the perichondrium and periosteum there are no movements in these joints so these are the 
together called the costae. It means costal cartilages plus ribs. The clinical importance of this is the costochondritis where there will be inflammation of the joint, costochondral joint. The sternocostal or condosternal joints are the joints between the medial ends of 1st to 7th costal cartilages and sides of sternum. The first sternocostal is a primary cartilaginous joint and it is atypical as it is united by a plate of fibrocartilage and there is no movement. Whereas the second sternocostal is atypical synovial with a double cavity in having slight movement. The third to seventh sternocostal joints are typical synovial joints having single cavity and they have a slight movement. The union is by continuity of pelchondrium and periosteum and this was strengthened by anterior and posterior radiate ligaments. The third variety in the costosternal system is the interchondral joints that is uh, between the costal cartilages that is uh, present among lower costal cartilages that is between the 7th to 9th costal cartilages it is uh, showing a cavity and the interchondral synovial joints show gliding movement and they are freely movable whereas that between the 9th and 10th costal cartilages presents no cavity and it is a fibrous syndesmosis and slightly movable joints. So that is about the interchondral joints. Now we have learnt about the various joints of the thoracic cage. So costo vertebral, costo sternal and the sternal joints and the vertebral joints. These are the four basic varieties and the subcategories under that you have learnt.